Good morning. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> this is great. So this is what happens when uh, we enter, you know, webinars and discussion via Zoom world. Um, very different from walking into an actual space, you know, where we could see each other and greet each other formally. Uh, so first, I want to, you know, thank and welcome our panelists, our guests, our friends who are joining us today on a very, very important conversation, which is education. So we will start um, now. So for those of you who are um, you know, watching us, um, settle in and let's get ready for a very good conversation on education. Welcome. And I like to do this all the time when I start a conversation to root us and to position us in current time. So right now it's 11.03 and it is Wednesday, November 18th. And last month we had the pleasure uh, to start a webinar series to discuss the three pillars that this organization holds itself accountable, which is criminal justice avoidance for young people who are court involved, ages 15 through 19, education progression and employability. And last month we started this conversation with Judge Riviezo one of the leaders who pushed to transform the juvenile justice system. And we got to see over so many years, New York City um, is starting you know, to think through and to push for what is fair opportunities for our young people. And this morning is a great privilege because our guests, they know the organization very well, but they're leaders and scholars in the, in the field. So let me formally introduce myself I'm Giselle Castro, the Executive Director at Exalt, and I have been the ED at this organization for four years now. And the way that we met um, Tabari Bumani, Principal Tabari Bumani was in our first year, or at least my first year here at Exalt, where we had two funders who were really interested in supporting our young people and this very specific pillar, educational advancement for our young people and we worked and we identified Principal Tabari Bumani to work with him. He is based at Boys and Girls High School, one of the schools that unfortunately was slated to close, but he led Nelson Mandela within the school system. And we worked with him for two years with great success. And I cannot wait to hear um, the principal you know, lead us through the conversation, the experience, and some of the questions that we will be asking. And then we have um, Dr. David Kirkland, who is a scholar in the field, who has been a great supporter and a partner to me, to the organization in thinking through these very complex you know, challenges of how do we advance our young people academically. He is now Dean at Steinhardt uh, at NYU, um, and he will you know, definitely correct me if I said anything you know, wrong since there are so many different titles. Um, but it's a pleasure and an honor to have him with us today since he knows the organization well. He's one of our board members and he started at the point in time that this organization in fact embarked on a growth plan. We also have Dr. Darnisa Amante Jackson who she too started to work with the organization when I started as an ED four years ago. And um, this is her first full year as a board member and it's great to have her as a scholar, her expertise. So I will close out with this and transition over to Brian Lewis, who is our deputy director. And he has been working very closely, not just in the organization, but helping us grow and scale and think through how do we advance our youth um, so without further ado, because I'm excited, I'm eager to hear this conversation, please welcome um, doc, um, I, we have so many doctors here, Brian Lewis, who will be leading us in the conversation. I will be muted. I will not be speaking at today's um, conversation. I will return um, with my closing remarks. Uh, so Brian, take it over. Thank you so much, Giselle. Really appreciate that. Um, so I'd like to begin by um, saying that this is the second webinar in our Leading with History series. The focus of this conversation will be education as the practice of freedom. James Baldwin famously said, people are trapped in history and history is trapped in them. 
The soul and the spirit of our Leading with History series reflects the eternal wisdom of this quote. As an organization, we at Exalt are led by knowledge of self and the past. It's deeply inscribed in everything that we do, and it is what leads to success in our outcomes for court-involved young people and helps to clear a path for a better and brighter future. As Giselle mentioned, my name is Brian Lewis. I am honored to be Exalt's Deputy Director. I've been with this organization since 2014. I started out as a teacher and I've moved up to my current role where I lead the organization through every aspect of our scaling and growth. As a black male who honestly struggled academically as a teenager, I'm incredibly honored to now support our court involved teens to make advancements in education and to fight every day through the work that we do at Exalt to attack systemic barriers that can stand in the way of our students' success. So throughout this discussion, you will hear a little more from me, as well as our distinguished panel of experts on how precisely we do this work and execute on our mission. So first I'd like to introduce Dr. Darnisa Amante Jackson. She is an educational and racial equity strategist, deeply committed to the study of culture, innovation and adult development. Since earning her master's degree in anthropology from Brandeis University and her doctorate from Harvard's educational leadership program, she is honored to have the knowledge, culture and adult development uh, expertise to transform organizational and school cultures on issues of equity. And she's gonna talk to you more about how she's done that work. Um, she's an expert in change management and redesign, and she currently serves as the CEO of the Disruptive Equity Education Project, D, and as system level leadership lecturer at Harvard's Graduate School of Education. Welcome, Darnisa. We also have Dr. David Kirkland, who is the Vice Dean and Executive Director of the NYU Metropolitan Center for Research on Equity and the Transformation of Schools. David is a leading national scholar and advocate for educational justice. He holds a PhD from Michigan State University and, J and a JD from the University of Michigan. He is a Detroit native. His transdisciplinary scholarship explores the variety of equity and education justice related topics, including school climate, discipline, school integration and choice, culture and education, vulnerable learners, and the intersections among race, gender, and education. With many groundbreaking educations to his credit, he's analyzed the cultures, languages, and texts of urban youth using quantitative, critical, literary, ethnographic, sociolinguistic research methods to answer complex questions at the Center of Equity and Social Justice in Education. And he was named by Ebony Magazine as one of the most brilliant scholars in the US. Dr. Kirtland has been a pivotal intellectual voice promoting educational justice in the US and abroad. And I'm also honored to say Darnisa and David are both Exalt board members. So we're really proud to have them as such. Finally, last but certainly not least, I'm glad to introduce Tabari Bomani. Tabari is the founding principal of Nelson Mandela School for Social Justice. He has experience working as a social studies teacher, a college advisor, and a dean of Bushwick Community High School, a Brooklyn-based transfer high school. He was also an adjunct professor in the African Studies Department in Manhattanville College in Purchase, New York. Uh, Tabari is a member of the Malik Fraternity and the Phi Alpha Theta National Historian Honor Society. He has lectured and performed poetry for community-based organizations, colleges, and universities. Um, and so as we uh, continue to uh, embark on this conversation, I just want to let everyone know that this is a participatory conversation because we at Exalt believe in participation. And so you can participate by using the Q&A function uh, to ask questions throughout the discussion and we will you know, get to your questions about halfway through this panel. I'm also honored to say that we do have Exalt students, current and past, uh, on this webinar this morning. And so we will prioritize Exalt students' questions in the discussion, but we welcome questions from everybody, from our funders, from our referral partners, from anyone who is interested in, and would like to pose a question. Um, so I'd like to start off by asking, first question, uh, and this question is actually for uh, Darnisa. Uh, Darnisa, as a CEO of Dig Deep for Equity and as one of the leading voices on understanding the way that systems impact us, can you please tell us what are the systemic issues that contribute to this thing that we call the school to prison pipeline? Mm, thanks so much, Brian. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. I don't know where you're watching from, a little Truman Show for us. Um, and so I think that's a really great question. And I think the, way, the best way to think about it is imagine there are four circles right in front of you. Right? There are four different types of oppression. 
So you have systemic oppression, which is ideological. That's all beliefs. You have institutional oppression, which is the policies and practices that are connected to those beliefs. And then the bottom two are more about people. So it's more about how what you believe and what we do to each other. But the systemic piece is pretty insidious because systems of oppression function in silence and they function by promoting beliefs that many of us don't know are there. The school to prison pipeline has its remnants going all the way back to the creation of the construct of race and the creation of hierarchy between races to justify slavery. Many people in this country, whether you know it or not, are being systemically, ideologically taught that black and brown community is dangerous and violent. And it's not like we want to believe it, but when all of your villains and shows are black and brown men and women, um, when even in Disney, in animation, our villains are of color, right? It creates this belief that people of color need to be policed more, are more dangerous, which unfortunately leads to disproportionality around discipline and prisons. So we create these systems that over-police black and brown students which inevitably leads teachers to believe that students need to be disciplined differently. We exit students from classrooms, folks get expelled, they get demerits, they experience detention. And the school to prison pipeline says, when institutions of education don't ask deep questions about the ideology that informs discipline policies, inform academic policies, we are more likely to disproportionately impact our black and brown students sending them into these over-policed pipelines that feel very much like prison and unfortunately do end up in prison. So just wanted to name the systemic piece, but no, Tabari, I know you see a lot of that on the ground with the, what happens when you go from ideology to belief at the teacher level, even internal belief at the student level that contributes to that pipeline. So, um, Brian, can I jump in there? For, can I jump in there now, Brian? Yeah, exactly. Please do. <laughs> so, because uh, Doctor got me excited. Uh, I think that that understanding um, is essential to us trying to deal with how do we end and crush the school to prison pipeline. You know, as a principal, um, I recognize that when I opened the school in 2014, there was this whole zero tolerance mentality, not just in my staff, but remember I came from being also a dean. And so to some extent, it required a transformation of thought from me, right? And then to create systems inside the building that reflected that transformation of thought. And one of the things that I recognize is that as I began to talk with my staff, especially among African and Latino people, the idea of zero tolerance, right? Because we are taught by the oppressor to internalize the oppression. The idea of zero, zero tolerance was promoted as this is how we save our young people. That if we do not over discipline them, if we do not over punish them, if we don't do it here, quote unquote, with love, then the system outside is gonna get them. And what I realized is that the system didn't have to wait for them. We were pushing them to the system, right? That we were preparing them more for the system than we were preparing them to do high levels of math. And so as a school that from the opening dedicated itself to restorative justice, uh, critical consciousness and cultural relevance, when I uh, met my brothers and sisters from Exalt, I was extremely happy because they were talking the language of real liberation education. The deal we saw it as the language of innovation, right? But the pedagogy of liberation has been around for a while. And just because they just discovered it in 2014 or 15 didn't make it innovation. It really made it the conversation around liberation. And what I loved about the Exalt, who became true partners, right? They always called me back to the center of my better self, right? Surrounding myself with them, they also reminded me that, Tabari, your frustration cannot be policy, right? Your ego cannot define what happens with these young people that you have to be guided by better ideals. And so I love Exalt, right? Exalt helped me build a school where students are loved first. 
right? And that discipline, while everything requires a certain levels of discipline, you cannot discipline a kid you don't love. You don't have that right. Mm. And so I'll stop there because I know so I'm many, talking about so many, <laughs> Well, so many jewels in that, Tabari. And, and I'd love to uh, now toss it over to David because I feel like this is a perfect entryway with David's expertise on um, understanding the particular ways that the, the kind of approaches that you outlined, Tabari, can, can disrupt systems and also help court involve young people to move forward. Uh, David trains all the exalt staff on our methodology and how we should engage with young people. So David, would you like to chime in here on, on anything that Tabari or Darnie Dhani, mentioned? Thanks so much, Brian. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I appreciate first being here with you today. And again, my name is David E. Kirkland. I'm the Vice Dean for Equity, Belonging, and Community Action in the Steinart School at NYU. I'm also the Executive Director of the NYU Metro Center and Professor of Urban Education in our Distinguished um, Department of Teaching and Learning at NYU. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that I'm sitting on Lenape land. And it's important, you know, um, that I make those recognitions for the individuals, you know, um, who are vulnerable, you know, um, or either erased and deleted. You know, I'm from this conversation. So I'm grateful that you all, you know, um, could bear with me. As I understand it, at least as I best understand it, this question or conversation around some school to prison pipeline is an idea, a metaphor that connects what happens in school directly to pathways of, of incarceration. As Dar Dr. Darnisha um, has so adequately and aptly, you know, um, mentioned. So if you look at school suspension stats, the same disproportionality that we see in schools, we also see in prisons, that black males are three times more likely to be incarcerated than their white male counterparts, that black women and girls are six times more likely to be incarcerated than their you know, um, white female counterparts. When you look at the architecture of schools, the edifice of being designed right, by those who designed our prisons, we see other associations from police officers and guards in schools to bars on doors and people being fenced in. The lunchroom resembles a mess hall, the ways people walk in line, but more so there is a the psychological issue. In our most disadvantaged schools, people feel trapped. But I wanna pivot the conversation some. Um, because I found a, pr a problem in the metaphor of school to prison pipeline, because it absolves the other pathways increases in society that we use to confine the vulnerable. My argument is simple, right? That we don't have a school to prison pipeline. But for about 100 million Americans, we just have prison. That we have entangled certain bodies, lodged them in spaces where freedom is not a possibility. We have trapped them in neighborhoods and confined them through systems that deny opportunity. And all of the other things that are needed to actualize a full existence. The structures of confinement mirror and lay on top of each other. Um, that's what it is. So the work that Exalt does isn't just about, you know, um, presenting projects and opportunities, right? It is a mass project of liberation that's based on community praxis and abolition work that leads to the full liberation of people through mechanisms of the mind. Because we know as Carter G. Woodson reminds us that the best way, you know, um, that, that, that if you wanna control a person's thinking, you know, um, you don't have, if you wanna control a person's actions, you don't, you have to control their thinking. And when you control a person's thinking, you don't have to tell them to go here or go there. They'll go without being told. And if there is no door for them to go out, out of, they'll cut one out for their benefit, for their education makes it necessary. Steve Biko puts it this way, that the most potent weapon of the oppressor are the minds of the oppressed. So I'm grateful for the organization of Exalt because Exalt has taken on the project and the problem of the incarceration not one that exists when we get to school or just enforced by the project of schooling for you know, um, subjugation, but the one that exists in our minds through media, through surveillance in neighborhoods and all these other instrumentalities, right? Exalt attacks the problem where it begins. And that's in the minds of our young people through projects of liberation that tell these young people that they matter. And that's abolition work. And I'm grateful for the abolition work that the organization does. Wow, thank you, David. That was that was extremely powerful. Um, so another thing that that Exalt does is is we sit with our young people to help them to accomplish their educational goals. 
And so every young person, you know, has an educational goal. Uh, you know, despite what, you know, as Darnisa mentioned and as everyone so eloquently has mentioned on this panel, you know, um, a, a brush gets painted of the black community and, and black youth in particular and youth of color, you know, who are over indexed within uh, prison populations that we don't care about our education or that we don't want to succeed. But that could be the furthest thing from the truth. And so we begin with the premise that our young people do want to be successful educationally. And then we sit down with them and we ask them, you know, where do they see themselves uh, a year away, three years away, five years away. And we develop a comprehensive plan that we call an IPP to help them maneuver through that plan and to remove obstacles that might stand in their way. Um, one of the things that I think has been laid bare by this COVID crisis is that systems have failed to present adequate plans for our young people to respond to the health crisis, to respond to the racial injustice crises that we've been talking about and that have existed for so long in this country. So this is an open question for all of our panelists. Considering that our school systems, our legal systems have clearly failed to execute a plan for our youth that can bring them to justice and help them to achieve their goals. What should our role be? What, what can we do to um, try to help our young people to, to continue to move forward in these challenging times? So if I may, can I um, just suggest a couple of quick things? Um, and so just quickly, this every morning at Nelson Mandela, we have, we pour out libations to the ancestors, right? And it's a, a large school community event, right? Now that we're on Zoom, it allows students who sometimes would run late to be uh, on the Zoom. And this morning libation, one of the teachers was talking with students around about attendance and about the struggle to get young people to sign in during this pandemic and this remote world. Um, and so I interrupted because the conversation seemed to be leaning towards this idea that people were giving up on learning. Um, and so what I said was that there's no young person that wakes up in the morning and said they don't wanna learn. Young people learn all day long. Um, what education in this country has failed to do is listen to them and their spirit, right? Young people don't sign on to nonsense, right? Young people know the difference between rigor and too much work, right? That is not rigorous. They understand when something is culturally relevant, even if they don't have the language. And that sometimes young people not signing on is a almost liberation radical uh, movement against an education that wants to enslave their soul. Right? Like I would argue that the educational system and the rest of these systems are not broken. They're doing what they were designed to do. The question is who wants to stand against that design? Right? And so, and once again, I'm not saying this because we want to uh, exalt Revenant. I love y'all. And the reason why I love y'all is because y'all have shown an ability to see invisibility. Right, I said this to you the other day, that y'all can look at young people and not see a convict, not see somebody who's caught involved, not see somebody who's a thug or in a gang. Y'all can look at young people and see them for who they are and help them see themselves and, and help them manifest the, the scholar that they want to be. And so the, the first thing I would say is that if everybody, judges, exalt, old principles like me, anybody truly believes that they want to do something during the pandemic and afterwards it is to dedicate themselves to true liberation pedagogy make sure that you finance and support groups like exalt even when it makes you uncomfortable right because critically conscious students should make everybody on this webinar uncomfortable because they will transform their environment and that transformation will be with you or on top of you Right, But if you are truly dedicated to liberation and liberation pedagogy, you will finance things that might make you uh, unnecessary. Sabari, can you even give us more insight? Because uh, that was so well said. And there were some really specific examples that you had highlighted when we were prepping for this uh, discussion. Can you, just, can you highlight maybe one of those examples that you had shared about what that looked like when Exalt first entered Nelson Mandela back in 2016? Very good. So I remember. So. Uh, just quickly, we opened the doors in 2014. I've never been a principal. I didn't have any kids in June. And by September, I had 130 kids and not enough teachers. And they cut my budget. 
right? Because anybody knows anything about schools, if you don't have your students in June, they freeze your budget. budget. So they, they have froze something like $350,000. And so one of the things that I said to everybody is, you know, we have an African name, we have African-centered principals. I have all these groups coming in saying, listen, we'll serve your students. I said, great. They was like, it's gonna cost you $65,000 for a semester. I was like, I can buy you a cup of coffee right now, but you're not getting $65,000. And I never saw those organizations again. In walked Exalt, and they was like, listen, we, are, we heard that you're into you know, restorative practice. We know that this campus is struggling. How can we serve the young people? I was like, I can buy y'all some donuts and coffee. We can talk about it. And Exalt said, let's do it. And so one of the things that Exalt did that I thought was beautiful is that they showed these young people, 130 of them, that Tabari wasn't the only person that cared about you. Right, that the staff at Nelson Mandela School for Social Justice were not the only people dedicated to your liberation and your education. But more importantly, when I'm, and I'll say this till the day I die about exalt, y'all show the young people that they are responsible for and to themselves. That the act of liberation is not an external act. Right, it's about internal will and decision, and an external revolutionary act. And revolutionary act can just simply be, yes, I can get an A in algebra, but that doesn't define me either. That I'm going to define what defines me. So someone like Silas, who is one of your students, who used to get in trouble every day. Silas is in my office every day. Silas, I hope right now is at Lincoln University, signing on to his Facebook, watching this webinar. I didn't take Silas into a uh, office building and have a graduation for him because he finished the program and had a funder who was there who showed these young people that they were important enough to fly from Wisconsin to come and see them. I did not do that. What I did was I, I, I uh, uh, partnered with abolitionists, liberators who did that with me. And so anybody who's listened to this, if you wanna know what the answer is, the answer is financing and standing side by side with organizations like Azul. It is believing that liberation is not only possible, but it's probable. And I'm, so the question is, how do you want young people to liberate themselves? Mm, that, I love that example. And, and here I'd like to open it up to David and Darnisa. Um, you know, this is something that you both talk about extensively in your work is, you know, how do, what is, what does self-liberation look like? What does liberation look like in the context of oppressive systems? Um, is there anything that you would like to, to chime in here? Uh, I'd love to take a stab. Thank you, Tabari, for just, I always get so excited hearing about liberatory processes. So thank you. You know, and sort of building on his point, I think the biggest thing that we can do, one of the biggest things that we can do is support students in continuing to understand themselves and their origin stories. When you talk about liberatory consciousness, right, a part of those systems of oppression that you heard me name before is that the reason oppression lives for so long is its goal is for you to oppress yourself and not just to oppress others. And there is a lot of unpacking that adults have to do and that students have to do about the messages that they've been sent their entire lives. Mary McLeod Bethune has this really great quote which starts off the book Ma'at. For any of y'all who want to check out Ma'at, I highly recommend this. Um, it's when it's like when you know who you are, you love yourself, and when you love yourself, you can demand respect. Liberatory consciousness doesn't work if unless you believe that you have a right to be free. And a part of this system has been inculcating Black and Latino youth to believe that they should be bound, that they should be imprisoned, that they are violent. And it's not just the system saying it to them. There is a point when you start to believe it too. And I think engaging in restorative storytelling, I don't know if y'all ever heard it before, but it's a thing and it works, right? Which is getting students to be able to access pieces of themselves that people maybe have never wanted to hear before, creating belonging. And belonging is not so much you being an expert, it's about creating the space or container for students to lean in to tell you more about themselves as you tell them more about yourself. It's the truest sense of healing, which I think is creating the space to build empathy for them to actually sort of blow up, for lack of a better word, like the things they've been told about themselves that are toxic. 
There are beautiful things in there that do not need to be unpacked, but toxicity is lifelong unless it's named. You can't dismantle anything that still remains invisible to you, even the beliefs that you have about yourself. So those type of spaces for storytelling and like leaning into difficult conversations, being able to talk about the toxic things you've been taught and to dream anew, to aspire to something, not that narrative is super, super important. Yeah, um, thank you for that, Donisa. Um, exalt creates, you know, at least in my mind, you know, and just to follow off Darnisa's point, exalt creates a space, you know, on that safe for students to go into. It's a fugitive space. You know, in a sense that Fred Moten talks about fugitivity, this space where people can, you know, um, be and feel as though they belong and feel safe in some other things. Why is that fugitive space important, right? For a project or a process of liberation or abolition, you know, as I would have it. It's important because our young people don't have those fugitive spaces. Everywhere they walk in Rome, there's a target on their back that says that you must be confined, you must be controlled, you must be abolished. Right, that you are nobody, that your life is dispendable, you do not matter, you're not valued or valuable. And exalt says the other thing, the thing that they have, they have to hear in order to live, and that is that you matter. And not only, I remember the first time walking into exalt, and I saw these young people on computers, and I saw young people that I see on the street with heart and faces smiling. I saw the softness and the innocence of these people in these bodies. And it was like magic. It was a, a certain type of alchemy that comes from an expression and a practice and a process of love that's gained not through, you know, kind of like pushing these students away, but embracing them, moving them in, holding them closely, right? Giselle Castro taught me that those who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. That community matters. That participatory deliberate action work matters. That creating the fugitive space, that space that is safe for our young people, space that they don't even get at home, that it matters because they matter, right? And so in terms of like, like what, what, what have we learned in COVID? What we learned in COVID is that we have to wrap our arms around each other. That we are in this together, Ubuntu. I am because we are. The decisions that I make affect you and the ones that you make affect me. That in some way we have carved out together this thing called community and it is that process, that participatory process, that liberatory process that moves us further. Because if you wanna go fast, go alone. But if you wanna go far, go together. I love that, David. And you know, one of the things that we've seen in COVID uh, now that Exalt has pivoted to a virtual model and, and we were one of the first organizations that serves Justice Involved Youth to successfully pivot in this way and to be zoomed and beamed into these young people's homes is that there is an added level of intimacy. And exactly what you mentioned, we, we get to see our young people in, an, in a whole new light, in a whole new way. And there's a warmth, there's, a, there's an additional layer of community that is being built. And I just wanna you know, um, second and, and highlight what you said, you know, we are here Everyone who is on this webinar today, all of the panelists, all the attendees, we are here to hold each other in strength. We are here to support each other. We know that these have been difficult times for all of us, but especially for our court involved youth community in New York City and all over this nation. And so, you know, part of what we want to accomplish today is to give some encouragement and to let you know that you're not alone, that, you're, that, that Exalt is here for you, that the folks who are on this panel are here for you, that there is an army of folks who believe in love and justice, who know that we will get through this and, and we will demonstrate that we will get through this together. I wanna, I wanna actually, this is a perfect opportunity to begin to segue to our question and answer. So uh, again, for all of our attendees, please drop your questions in the Q and A uh, function at the bottom of your, of your Zoom. You can also use the chat feature if you prefer that. If you want to identify yourself, it just helps us to know more of who we're talking to and to expand that beloved community that we are continually expanding at Exalt. Uh, but I do have an initial question from one of our graduates. Um, and this graduate wanted to remain nameless, uh, but I'll, I'll share the question that um, this graduate asked me to ask today. This student asked me, uh, I was a student who was in school and never got asked about my court 
cases or my arrests. I always felt like the school was ashamed of the fact that I was arrested and involved in the system. Exalt helped me to get back into school and transfer to a new school where I didn't feel that level of shame and embarrassment. And now I'm a high school graduate and I'm working on getting my GED. Can you please explain to me why it is that schools seem to be so ashamed of young people who get arrested? Where does this come from and what is this about? How much time we have? That, that's a whole, that's the best question. So thank you for asking that. And I know, I hope you know whomever asked, the reason for the pause is not that your question was not valid. That one could take a whole day. So I wanna give a little bit more thought, but to Bari, David, if y'all wanna start off while I continue to percolate, but I just appreciate that one so much. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll chime in. You know, um, I think Tabari, you know, excellently said that the system, you know, um, works as it is designed, right? It works as it is designed. But we also know that the system wasn't necessarily designed for all of us. It wasn't designed to love all of us, to nurture all of us, that it commits shame upon our bodies and it has done so through mechanisms that, you know, um, delete our language from the curriculum. It tells us if you speak, if you come from a community who speaks like I speak, you know, um, where my grandmother said things like, I love me some you, right, would tell me that I'm wrong, that that system wasn't born to love me, that that system has already, you know, um, poured shame atop of my body. So it's not surprising to me that, you know, when we walk into so many of our schools, that they pour shame into the bodies of our, our students. They were designed that way. They were designed to see some of us as criminal when we walk into the door, as less than when we walk into the door, right? And the question that, that, that we have to have is this other type of pause that loves us back, right? This idea that we are not broken, but too often our systems are, right? And how can we begin to recalibrate those systems, much like Exalt does when it stands in the gap to say, say to those systems that there's nothing wrong with these young people? How do we have an advocate and a champion because unfortunately, that's what we need when we have systems that had been designed to see us, you know, um, through eyes that are impaired, to see us through eyes that are distorted, right? So when, when and, and I've been working in schools now for 25 years, and I understand, you know, how this mechanism actually works and how this mechanism actually operates. When, you know, um, a student comes in, you know, um, with a label, uh, IEP label, right, an ability label, or a prison label, it does not matter. That schools do not deal, deal well with stigmas. If you got black skin or not black skin, does do not, um, don't do well with stigmas because its job has been to enforce the type of bias and ranking, right, lower rung that is placed on those types of stigmas. And it's our job to kind of like disrupt that nonsense. It's our job to redesign and push and move and demand that these broken systems that hurt us become fixed. Mm. I'm sitting in that one, David. I'm gonna offer in addition to David, but an alternative perspective, um, which is, you know, the absence of something is still a something. The absence of having systems that support educators and being able to truly meet students in all of these different needs, addressing labels, discussing the difficulty of a student's life. These are not things that schools or many educators who work in urban spaces have ever learned how to do. That's not your fault, but there isn't a process to engage in care-based education everywhere. The ability to talk about your prison record from the past assumes people know how to meet you in empathy, that they know how to sit and hear your story in absence of judging you. So many people are afraid to do something that they don't feel expert in, that they would rather not do it than to inflict more pain in their non-expertise. It doesn't make it right. But I think that question is a call to what does education as a sector need to reinsert into our veins? 
the social emotional care, empathy based care, being able to relinquish the fact that everybody wants to be a part of the solution, but very few people want to implicate themselves as a part of the problem. And to truly sit in your record as educators to implicate themselves in why you even have the record. Because somewhere along the way, someone didn't show up and someone didn't do something that you needed. And to even be able to address that on the other side means we have to acknowledge the stuff that didn't happen. And that's very hard for people to sit in multiple truths, but it doesn't mean they shouldn't do it. The absence of them doing it created your shame. But please know there is no process yet to make sure that every student can have a conversation like you're seeking. And that feels like a call to the sector, but it's received. So if I may, I wanna, somebody gonna probably have to cut my mic off, right? Um, because this is enormously like everybody and like the two, listening to the two of y'all speak, set me on fire, right? This is enormously personal. Right. I was out of, I say this to people all the time, out of, I think, 468 students who graduated from my high school, I was 466 or 465. The only people who did worse with my three friends, right? We graduated at the bottom of our graduating class. I hated school. Every ounce of it, everybody in it, right? I was the kid that got suspended at least every other week. I literally came into the building one day after being uh, on suspension for five days. And within 20 minutes, I was back in the dean's office being suspended. My father hadn't even left campus yet. So I was able to get back <laughs> on the bus with him and go home, right? And so for me, entering the space of a school, right? I recognize a couple of things. I'm gonna try not to go all over the place. The first is the schools are as racist as the society is. It's also as class-based as society is. And so unfortunately, there are too many people in the buildings of schools who bring with them all of that that uh, has impacted their lives, right? And so they bring the values of class. They bring the, the vomit-ridden confusion of racism and oppression, and they create systems of, for our young people and perpetrate the same thing that stripped them of their soul before when they were young. And because no kid should feel shame about being arrested or being caught involved. And what, I, what bothers me is either kids have to feel shame or they have to feel ignored because sometimes schools are not just judging them, they're ignoring them. Right, my, my concern is that most schools don't give a, and you can fill in the, the blank. And so that students walk around feeling not just shame, but invisible because they do have a label, right? Um, and I think that all the things that we talk about is, is seated in this. I've had conversations because I think this brother and sister made it clear that oppression cannot work unless the oppressed, or you call them the subaltern, or you call whatever term you wanna use, they have to speak the language of the oppressor. The oppressor can't do it alone, right? And so the oppressor must have you speak his or her language. And whether that oppressor is teaching you to speak racist language or class-based language or misogynistic language or anti-LGBTQ language, it is a must. And so I've sat in spaces with people who look like me, who have spoken badly about a kid that is caught involved but then have Malcolm on their wall. That's intellectual spiritual damage. That teacher is speaking of pathology and they are teaching pathological thoughts to those children. And then we have to decide that we're gonna stand against the pathology. I understand why teachers speak to pathology because you are certified by a system that created the pathological thought. And so by the time you finish getting your degrees, they are hoping that you're not like uh, Dr. Kirkland and Dr. Uh, Amante. They're, that's their hope because there's profit in the pathology. And so 
I, I, I'm going to stop because I'm getting ready to start. So I'm going to stop there for a second. <laughs> I was that that's it's so well said, Tabari, and, and extremely powerful. Um, I want to I want to make sure we get to a few more questions. I see them populating. Uh, we have this question from Nicole Baez. I can I can quickly answer this question, then we can move on to the next one. Nicole asks, how has the coronavirus pandemic affected Exalt's ability to execute its education pillar on current students? Um, so as I mentioned, Exalt assists court involved students to get re-enrolled in school when they have not been enrolled in school. Um, if they are enrolled in school, we help them to make sure that they are making progress and getting their credits. We help them work toward a high school diploma. And then uh, recently, within the last two years, we piloted a program along with my friend Stephanie Gilman at CUNY College uh, to help court-involved students get college credit while they're still in high school. And so this was a revolutionary program where we uh, recommended these students based on their critical thinking acumen. It had nothing to do with their grades or their attendance in school to enroll in this program and get free college credit and a college experience and college support. And the program has since, has since uh, ballooned. And so now this program has expanded all over the city, but, but we were a leader in, in launching that initial class and co-piloting that with, with CUNY College. Um, so these are some of the things that we were doing before COVID. Since the uh, pandemic has hit, we continue to offer all of these things virtually. So we do our education assessment with our young people through Zoom. We either do it one-on-one -on -one or in a collective setting. Uh, we then make sure that we are helping them with um, enrolling in school virtually. So all of these things can still be done through a virtual format. Uh, there are virtual open houses that are taking place and we make sure our students have the link to those open houses. Um, and we follow up with them, make sure they attended, make sure they had the information that they need, send them links to online applications for schools, and just continue to track that progress and, and support them toward achieving their, their educational goals. Uh, let's see, the next question, this is a great one, and, and I'm not sure who asked this, but um, it says, liberation theology has been defined as a movement that emphasizes liberation from social, political, and economic oppression as an anticipation of ultimate salvation. How does this compare to liberation pedagogy and when or how might it be relevant to exalt educational strategies? I should mention, despite what people often think, Exalt is not is a secular organization. <laughs> so I like the question because you know we've been talking a lot about spirit. And, you know, um, and, and what that means. And we understand that our young people come from all kinds of spiritual backgrounds. Uh, but I like this, this question about, you know, uh, liberation theology and, and what some of the, the ramifications might be for, you know, how we think of, 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 uh, of things like faith. Yeah. So, 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 Brian, I'll speak to it, you know, and I'll try to speak to it quickly, you know, um, with a story. Exalt, you know, takes in individuals that we've starved. Gloria Latson Billings, she talks about an education debt that we owe things to certain individuals that some people get a payment, other people don't, right? She's reflecting this idea that um, Martin Luther King came, came up with, this idea that, you know, when it comes to certain people that we've paid them with a faulty check, you know, um, that has come back non-sufficient funds. Exalt, you know, in terms of, you know, like, like, like it's theology and long liberation, you know, um, kind of like theology. It's about feeding people and feeding their souls. It's about nourishing our young people with diets of ideas and actions, you know, um, that make their life better. There's this Cherokee proverb of a grandfather speaking to his grandfather, grandson. The grandfather says that a fight is going on inside of me. It's a terrible fight and it's between two wolves. One is evil, he is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority and ego. He continued, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside of you and inside of every other person too. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? The grandfather replied, the one you feed. Exalt feeds us well. It feeds us the right wolf. I was waiting for the end. I love that. And I think to that, the question as well, liberation pedagogy and liberation theology, I think in my mind, ask us to assume the same thing. 
which is that inequity is a design, that there is no such thing as meritocracy. There's no such thing as pulling yourself up by the bootstraps here, because in this country, there are people without boots, without straps, and without feet. It calls us to realize that there are different roles, at least in the US context. You have the people who have the power to make the institutions, to further the ideology, and you have the folks who are subject to it. And Freire tells us the role of the oppressed is to bring the oppressor into the know. But that liberation doesn't end in just the oppressor knowing, it's the oppressor's willingness to dismantle themselves and to dismantle the systems that oppress. And I think the root of all of that, in my opinion, is faith. It takes a mighty faith to stare oppression in the face over multiple generations, continuing to do the thing that I think many oppressed have to do, which is even in darkness, hope. But hope is a verb and it's continuous. And to me, that's the intersection. And I think Exalt instills hope. To David's point, it feeds us with hope, but it's not just hope, right? Hope extends to advocacy, to access, to disruption of bias in yourself, to community, to partnership, and to belonging. So if that's where hope gets us, I'll take that forever. So I don't know if I'm gonna be able to go back to work after this one. I'm gonna go somewhere and write some poetry and something. Um, so for me, my theology is my pedagogy and my pedagogy is my theology. Um, and what I mean by that is that, you know, when I was a seven year old boy sitting in a small Baptist church on Hollis Avenue in Queens, right? I understood that Jesus that they talked about in that church was a revolutionary, right? When I converted and went to the masjid um, on Hart Street and Bushwick Avenue, right? And they, we talked about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I understood from the Hadith that one cannot claim to be part of the Dean and not be engaged in social justice action. And so for me, pedagogy is the pathway for me to see the realization of the theology that I have embraced, right? Um, this is theological work. Right? You can't talk about freedom and not have faith and hope and understand that you are serving a higher purpose. I don't care what you call that higher purpose. That I can't bend the knee, right, if I don't bend my back to the work. Right? Because what am I? I can't ask for grace and not offer it. Too often in this country, we have people, whether they're Muslims, Jewish, Christian, or whatever who sit in classrooms, who sit on benches, who sit in hospitals, who have forgotten that the person that they claim that they serve would offer love to the person that they're injuring. Neither Muhammad, Christ, nor Buddha would suspend kids at, at, at a rate where three times uh, more black kids are being suspended than their white and Asian counterpart. There's no religious person you can point to that would accept the fact that a wealthy country cannot give every kid a laptop and Wi-Fi. You crazy. And so our call to liberation education, liberation pedagogy is a call, a spiritual, physical, right, intellectual call to our better selves. Restorative justice is not a practice. It's a call to our better selves. I have a saying that Mandela, right? And listen, I'm not perfect. There are teachers who get mad at me. I've been written up. Uh, a teacher filed an OEO case against me last year that said that I was a racist. <laughs> and so I called this teacher during the summer. And I said, now that the case is over, I offer you my brotherhood. You're still going to be at the school. I still don't like the way you treated the black and brown students that we were talking about. How do we come back together? And the reason why I said that to him is because I have to be what I proclaim. 
I can't have Nelson Mandela as a name in my school and not understand his commitment to restorative practice. We have judges and lawyers who love Mandela. They got their posters up. Do you have to be committed to restorative practice? You have to be committed to group, groups like Exalt because Mandela would be committed to groups like Exalt. He would exalt, exalt. This is the last thing I'm gonna say to you. We gotta be surrounded by people who are our spiritual reminders, right? Because it's hard. It's easy to understand and embrace oppressive mentality. So this year at Mandela, I did something that made me very happy. I hired a brother named Norman Londonio, right? And I wanna make sure all you'll get a chance one day to meet Norman. Right, Norman is, he probably doesn't mind me saying, he's about 43 now. When I met Norman, he was 17 years old and he was facing three charges of grand theft auto. A year after I met him, Norman's best friends were convicted of murder and they're doing 25 years to life. I made a determination that I was gonna be in Norman's life the day I met him. And so Norman and I have been uh, brothers from the moment that we met Went to Hofstra, he graduated from Hofstra, became a teacher, had to go down south for a little while, take care of a dying parent, returned, is now licensed as a special ed teacher. And I welcomed him on my staff, not because that's my brother and not because I love him like a son. I welcomed him on my staff for two reasons, because he can speak the language of young people and the language of restorative justice. He can speak the language of critical consciousness and be able to be a physical manifestation of what that looks like. Not because he has a degree and not because he makes more money, but because he's about doing things for Kit and Ken. That he's about returning to where I first met him, right? Because there are those there waiting for him. That he is a Harriet Tubman educator. And so I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Beautiful, Tabari. And, and, and thank you uh, to all of our panelists. I do wanna give our executive director Giselle Castro, an opportunity to close us out. Uh, Giselle, any, any parting words? Sure, and I will be very, very quick you know, since um, many of you will have to start jump, jumping off. But first of all, thank you, um, Principal Bumani, um, Dr. Darnisa, Armante, Dr. Kirkland for such a very important conversation. And I was just looking at the questions and answers and our audience, you know, they're, they're pretty vast and wide. And you know, when we ask this question, how do we advance our young people? It's great to see that at the core, we're also talking about a philosophy, a premise. You know, we call it, Dr. Kirkland calls it exalt soul. The organization really focuses on four tenets, which is to humanize, inspire, validate, and motivate our young people. And you know, when we think about what does that mean, it is at the core, the human spirit. Uh, there's so much about this organization and because we are wrapping up you know, um, with time, I want to once again encourage everyone who is listening to us who would like to learn more about the organization you know, to please you know, look us up on our website or to schedule um, a chat you know, with Brian and myself. Um, I won't encourage you know, our board members are very busy, but at any given point, we could probably resume a different conversation. But you know, a special thanks to Principal Bumani, who has done so much in the borough of Brooklyn and for education and to in, in liberating our young people. And I also want to acknowledge and thank, although he's a private donor, the donor um, that supported the project to work at the school. So once again, I want to encourage everyone to take a moment of pause, reflect on all that we learned today. And I'll leave you with this question. And I love posing question, what can we do to create a, a more just society, especially now that we have teenagers who are perhaps disconnected, we're transitioning soon into Thanksgiving, into a holiday. What can we do to move our young people forward, ensuring that none of them stay behind? So thank you for taking this hour from the morning into the afternoon to listen to one of our main pillar, which is advancing our young people academically. Uh, thank you, Brian, for facilitating this wonderful conversation. I enjoyed this so much. Thank you, Mai. Thank you to our board members who are here supporting us virtually. Um, and then also our funders and our wonderful staff 
Thank you all. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy the day. And please um, follow us. We will be sending out the next announcement for the third and final webinar, which is with another um, board member of ours, but to focus on employability, our internship component. Once again, thank you all, be well, and we will stay connected. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your week and a wonderful day. Take care.